Okay, grade eight, let's talk about the Industrial Revolution. Now, what is a revolution? Well, revolution simply means a total turnaround. Let's think of the root word revolve. When something makes a huge revolution or a total revolution, it means it's gone all the way around. Okay, and when it returns to its starting point, it's not quite the same again. So the earth revolves around the sun. Let's say it was in a specific position on January 4th. When it comes back January 4th, it'll be in more or less the exact same position, right? But it won't be January 4th the same year. The same with the clock. When the minute hand revolves all the way around the clock, even when it comes back to 12, it won't be the same hour. So the clock's in the same place, but not exactly, right? The entire clock would have to make a revolution until the next day, and even then, it's a whole new date. So when we talk about revolutions in history, we mean that society has made a total turnaround. And when things go back to normal, there's a whole new normal. Got it? Revolution means it's totally turned around. As for the word industrial, one of the first things that comes to mind is machines. And when we look at words related to industrial, other words come to mind like industry, industrious, induce. So basically anything that's industrial or induces means you're keeping busy and you're being very productive. You're producing more results than you ever have before. Okay, so when you think about industrial, think about machines and think about anything that produces a lot of results. Okay, how does this work? Well, because of the industrial revolution, we don't have to wait around for nature to take its course. If we want a specific result, we can induce that result. For example, if a mom is pregnant, she can induce labor. In other words, she doesn't have to wait today until her due date. Instead, she can go to the hospital and say, I want to give birth next week. Can you can you guys induce labor? Okay. But that happened with the Industrial Revolution all across human interaction. And because of the Industrial Revolution, we can induce society to give us the results we want. So if you want an apple, you can just go to the store and get an apple. You don't have to wait for apples to be in season because we have entire industries which make sure that no matter where you live in the world, no matter what season it is, you have an apple available as long as you follow all the industrial measures. Got it? Let's look at this in simpler terms. So... Before the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to travel very far with something, you might have taken a donkey or a horse or even a camel. You might have had to travel very far and you couldn't do as much. And think about that. Would you be able to travel as much? Wouldn't you have to make sure that the donkey was healthy, feed him, wait until he was old enough? And you could only use him for as long as he was alive. But after the Industrial Revolution, you could use a train. A train doesn't need feeding. You don't have to wait until it's old enough. You don't have to worry if it's ever going to die. And you can take so much more with you. So that train over there that you can see is a steam train. Remember the word steam. Very important for the Industrial Revolution. In the same way, before the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to travel very far, maybe you wanted to sell things to another country, you would have to take a sailboat and you'd have to rely on the wind to determine how far you would go. You'd also have to rely on people who need to rest to help you row the boat. But after the Industrial Revolution, you had steamships. Whenever you read about Industrial Revolution ships, you'll see SS, that means steamship. Notice steam again, very important to the Industrial Revolution. Now think about what all of this means. The donkey to the steam train or the, the sailboat to the steam engine, right? It was all very slow because you had to rely on people, on animals, on weather conditions. You know, if there are muddy waters, 
when you and your donkey are traveling, you really couldn't get as far as you could with the steam trains, right? If there were all kinds of storms that would slow you down, people and their labor, that limited how many people you could sell your stuff to. So you couldn't make as much money. So just have all of these things in mind when you think about the Industrial Revolution. After the Industrial Revolution, you could produce more of anything, you could reach more people, you could make more money because of machines that were coming into being. Okay, now notice how steam has always got something to do with this. Let's see. And probably the most important shift in the Industrial Revolution, how we got food. So before, we would live a very organic and natural lifestyle. We called it an agricultural lifestyle. Most people lived on farms. You would eat what was produced on your farm or the farms closest to you and whatever you were able to harvest and put away. So you were vulnerable to weather conditions, to drought, to people stealing, all kinds of things, to people limiting how much land you could grow things on. Later, we had a society in which food was made by factories. And so suddenly, there was more production of that available. And with all of these steam engines and steam trains, even if you ran out of a certain kind of food, it could be imported and brought to you. Okay, but this is the most important shift because the whole of society, the majority of people used to live on farms in an agricultural society. And then most of them moved to cities. We call this industrialization or urbanization. Remember, urban has to do with cities and agriculture has to do with farms. So just picture the world before the Industrial Revolution. Most people lived on farms. After that, most of those farm people moved to cities to go and work in factories, the vast majority of people. Now, how did all these machines work? Notice I said steam ship earlier, I said steam train earlier, I said factories. All of these things were powered by the steam engine. From a mechanical point of view, the steam engine is the most important part of the Industrial Revolution. Notice how I said from a mechanical point of view. So far as machines are concerned, one of the most important parts is the steam engine. But obviously, it's more complex than that. That was just the machine part of it. Human beings and animals were still part of the Industrial Revolution, and people all across the world contributed to the Industrial Revolution. In fact, there was a very real and very huge human cost to this. I'm talking about children. I'm talking about women. I'm talking about people in the slave trade. There was a massive cost to us moving to what we call an automated or industrial society. Okay? When society completely turns around from working in a natural way to working in a machine-driven way, people are often treated like they are nothing more than the cogs in a machine. Okay, so you and I started to be seen as just parts of a machine. The whole of society might be described as a machine. But in the meantime, all I want you to focus on for now is the steam engine because it powered a lot of this change. Okay, so well done to getting this far in the video. From here on out, I'm just going to show you pictures from the Industrial Revolution so that anytime in an exam or a book you start seeing these pictures, your mind immediately goes to the Industrial Revolution, the turning point at which we went from a farming society in which we had been for hundreds and thousands of years, even though there were cities, there were less cities than there were um, farms, okay? And then we went into an industrialized society, all right? So just keep thinking about this total turnaround in society, how it affected people's lives. Take in this image and see what you notice. Now imagine what it would be like if you were in their shoes. Got it? Good.
Okay, I hope you're wrapping your head around this idea of the Industrial Revolution. You saw images there of entire societies moving from a more farm-based life to a more machine-based life. But these people still had to work very, very hard. And the last image I showed you were of people involved in child labor, little children who worked there. Many got injured. And if you look at the screen now, you're going to see people such as children. You're going to see women and how they worked there. And so I just want you to know that the Industrial Revolution was not exactly a time in which the poor were treated very well. It wasn't a time in which women and children were treated very well because they tended to fight less with the boss than the men did. So people actually loved hiring women and they loved hiring children. They loved hiring people that wouldn't complain. Children were valuable to the, to the bosses because they could crawl under small spaces and many of them got burnt and hurt really badly. It was also a tough time for racial tensions. So the Industrial Revolution would actually influence a lot of other kinds of revolutions we'd have. And the men also worked very hard. Many people suffered a lot okay and you'll learn more about that in history class um but what does this have to do with us in south africa because the industrial revolution was mostly taking place in great britain and then it went over to the united states of america now remember i mentioned something about slavery but slavery was abolished at this time remember that for these manufacturing plants to take place it wouldn't have been possible for big factories to be built if they didn't have free natural resources. And where did they get them? Well, a lot of them came from the colonies. We know a lot. You must have learned by now about the transatlantic slave trade in which people were taken from West Africa to the Americas, both North and South America and any of the islands there. And they made raw materials and they had free raw materials to take to Britain to start these factories. And they used their poor, who they essentially kicked out of farms and essentially had them working there so there was a huge human cost to this happening as i've said before but as south africans what does this have to do with us you see during the slave era they knew that our coastline was valuable but what they didn't know was that we are a mineral rich country and in order to have an industrialized society up to this day you cannot have that without south africa and her neighboring states because you absolutely need the resources that South Africa has to provide. So we were pulled into it. All right, so I'm sure you talk a lot in class about South Africa's natural diversity and all of its natural resources, but a lot of our wealth lies underground. We are a mineral rich country. Remember that. What you're looking at now is the beginning of the mining era which started in the 1800s in South Africa. In the 1860s they discovered diamonds in Kimberley. In the 1880s, in 1886, they discovered gold in Johannesburg. And very shortly here I'm going to show you a picture or a video of those early mines in Johannesburg. But as you're thinking about this, start thinking about how the Industrial Revolution got us to where we were today. There was no such country as South Africa. Of course, there was a place in the South of Africa, but it was broken up into many different kingdoms of the various people. And you know all of our languages. So, for example, a Zulu kingdom and you had a Sutu kingdom and you had Khoisan kingdoms. There were so many Khoisan people still, right? And then you had Bura republics. And then you also had a British colony or two. I think you had about two, depending on which part of the decade we're talking about. All right. And so then when the British abolished slavery, they needed cheap labor. And that's how a lot of us got to where we were today. Okay. A lot of sad stuff happened, um, as you will find out in history. But for now, all we need to understand is why all of this happened. Because South Africa is richer than you think. It's rich underground. Diamonds, gold, coal, platinum. Okay, so I am going to play you that video in a moment. But with a lot of people traveling here and coming to our country, a lot of people from all over the world wanted land here. And that started so many fights. And Britain, which was the most powerful empire, 
came and they took over and they created the union of South Africa, which means they put all the different colonies and kingdoms together and united them, but under their name. But let's think about this. You saw how cruel they were to their own poor. So do you imagine that they were kind to our poor at that stage? I don't mean to say that all British people are unkind. That would be unfair of me to say. I'm just talking about some greedy people who treated their own people in factories in very terrible ways. Do you imagine that they cared about kindness to us? No. So they would start researching South Africa very carefully because they really wanted control of her. They really wanted control of our mineral resources so that they could build their wealth. Okay? And because of that, they started writing all of these laws, which you'll learn about later. Population Registration Act, Separate Amenities Act, um, Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. All of these were laws that were the foundation for what would later become apartheid. All of these were laws which gave us the definitions that we think of today as white or colored or Indian or black. Right? They knew that if we all stood together, we'd be too strong. We're stronger together. So they needed to divide us. There was a man by the name of Lord Milner, and he realized that he needed to divide us racially. When we wouldn't work for him, he brought 600,000 people from China to work here. Right? And that's when he realized, wait a minute, I can get these people to fight racially. Okay. But for now, just focus on why. Okay, so next I'm going to show you um, an old-fashioned movie, a black and white movie about all of our minds. And I'll try and talk over it and explain what's going on. And I'll show you a modern video over that, which explains that South Africa, it's by an economist. He explains that we are still a mineral-rich country. And he's going to describe to you exactly how rich we are. Got it? Good. All right, so this video is called Gold and Diamond Mines of South Africa. It's from America and it's actually made by an, a corporation by Thomas Edison. Remember Thomas Edison's name because he's an entrepreneur who helped spread the light bulb, which was invented by Nikola Tesla. So he's saying Johannesburg, the metropolis of South Africa, in the heart of the gold mining district. So there's Johannesburg popping up. It was a boom city because so many people rushed for the gold rush and boom, 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 they needed new houses. Boom, 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 they needed new restaurants. Boom, 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 they needed cab drivers. There's the Joch mine, one of the richest gold mines in the world. So they even imported miners all the way from England. And you're going to see them in a minute. And people migrated from all over South Africa, places like KwaZulu Natal, even other Southern African countries like Zimbabwe, which at some point was called Rhodesia. And they migrated and they came to work in all of these industries, particularly the mining and the railroad, which had to take the gold ore. So it says bringing gold ore from a depth of 3,000 feet. Oh, this was so new back then. Look at those machines. That's so industrial revolution. The machines helping us to go further than ever before. And people were desperate for Johannesburg's gold. And so the migrant workers would work on the railroads. And as they were working on the railroads and in the mines to encourage themselves, it says here the tube mill, the ore is pulverized and being passed through these revolving cylinders. But what was I saying? Had to encourage themselves to work harder in the hot African sun, they would sing a song called Shosho Loza. And so maybe after this video is finished, you guys can sing Shosho Loza and think about all the migrants. The pulverized ore, there are some miners who knows where in South Africa they come from or even Southern Africa. They've traveled a long way and they lived in very difficult conditions and there were a lot of racial tensions and they weren't paid very well. It says from Sinai, the tanks and the waste rock is conveyed to the dump heap, right? You still can travel to Johannesburg and see these huge mine dumps. They now look like mountains with forests on them. There are some rail tracks of people pushing up um, what they've mined, right? And it's going to be taken on trains all over the world. And sorry, trains all over to the coast and then all over the world from there. And that guy probably sang Shoshaloza, miners coming to the surface from a depth of 3,000 feet. Let's have a look at the miners. Oh, they're going to come up. Look at that lift over there. You've got some African miners standing there on, on the back. These are probably British miners who previously had worked in the coal mines in Britain, potentially. Look at them coming up there. 
and coming out, people from all over the world moved here. And you know, there would even be a war over this. Um, they so desperately wanted Johannesburg's gold. Okay, very soon we're going to see Kimberley. There it is, the center of the world's largest diamond mines. Did you know Kimberley had more millionaires than anywhere else in the world? A millionaire back then was like a billionaire today. There's Kimberley. Kimberley was so rich it even had electricity in some parts before London did right the biggest diamond in the world is from kimberley the star of africa also known as the cullinan diamond which is which south africa gifted to the royal family the offices of the company controlling the diamond mines in the transvaal look like a saratoga hotel so the transvaal is made up of gauteng limpopo the northwest and mpumalanga all of that used to be one province called transvaal and there's a fancy hotel popping up because a lot of rich pe people came here to come and survey all right so thank you so much for watching so south africa is a mineral rich country and as you can see there there was all kinds of poverty and there was all kinds of wealth you saw that wealthy hotel because many wealthy people invested money and to this day people who have money are interested in looking at south africa so let's watch a video of a clever british economist explain to potential investors in south africa just how mineral rich south africa is so that they can understand what's going on if they are thinking about sending money to our country to this day south africa is a mineral rich country having the world's largest reserves of platinum the third largest reserves of coal the six largest reserves of gold and the seventh of diamonds. So you see, the mineral revolution led to us finding even more stuff underground. Let's watch this video of an American president from the 80s talking about all the stuff South Africa has underground as well. Strategically, this is one of the most vital regions of the world. Around the Cape of Good Hope passes the oil of the Persian Gulf, which is indispensable to the industrial economies of Western Europe. Southern Africa and South Africa are repository of many of the vital minerals, vanadium, manganese, chromium, platinum, for which the West has no other secure source of supply. Wow, isn't that hectic? Did you have any idea we had so many natural resources in our ground and on south african soil isn't that incredible but why you may ask yourself is south africa such a mineral rich country and yet other countries who don't have the minerals are so rich in practice well think back to what made them wealthy the industrial revolution where they built factories or what we call manufacturing plants south africa is a great place for extracting raw materials but you and i still have to turn it into a wonderful place for manufacturing that that means making actual products from our raw materials what we need to do instead of sending them overseas is develop the skills of young people like you so that you can make history and one day children will be studying you in history and realize that you changed the face of south africa so why don't you talk with your teacher about the different paths you can go into so that we can have a stronger manufacturing industry just like the Springboks make South, African, South Africans proud with their rugby, perhaps you can make South Africa proud by creating new industries. Perhaps you can study overseas and bring skills back to South Africa. You could just, you could even make a lot of money for yourself, but not just you, you could help feed families in South Africa. In doing so, you would correct a lot of the injustices that have happened during the mineral revolution and after it in south africa because all of this stuff is interconnected so try your best to take it all in try and learn what happened in britain try and learn what happened in america try and learn what happened in south africa and all over africa the more you invest in the gold and the diamonds and the platinum that exist in your mind the more you can develop 
an amazing South Africa. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Please go back to this video so you can really ingest it. It's a great foundation for the rest of your high school careers, understanding of history, because history is not just about what happened in the past, but it's a way to find out how we got here so that we can know where we're going in the future. Thank you so much. Like, subscribe, and pass those exams. Bye, guys. Love you.